Thank you, Sean. Oh, thank you. Let's see. Um, well, I guess. Hi, I everybody. I'm going to introduce you, Gary. I will not let you do that yourself because no. you deserve the honor to be presented because I was lucky enough to come across you in my time in the Guild. And since then, I would say I already call you a dear friend. I hope you agree. If not, don't do it publicly, please. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm very happy to present to you Gary Monti. He brings decades of experience to the table in various uh, parts on the one side on project and change management and the other side also in teaching and consulting. And as any great medical practitioner who wants to help a patient really getting healthy and thriving instead of just treating the symptoms, so does a great consultant. And this is exactly what Gary does. So that Gary tries to get to the root causes of things in order to help his clients to really get healthy and thriving. So I, I know you, you know that I love this quote of yours. So he's often asking the question, what is the one thing all of your problems have in common? Well, it's you. And this is my hand over to you, Gary, and your session on the impact of deep psychology on the bottom line. Oh, the show thank is yours. You, okay, now I have to live up to that introduction. Oh my God, the pressure is on. Oh. Uh, okay, let me share my screen here. Uh, oh, I need to be able to share, Eva. I'm not the host now. Could oh. the host please enable oh, yes. Gary? Gary, I'm going to post your LinkedIn credentials to the crowd so they can follow you and track your work publicly. Oh, sure. Let me try to see. Nope, I still can't share yet. You get a second here for Sean to click the magic button. Try now, okay. Gary. Yes, I'll give it a go now. Let me find, let's see. Okay, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Affirmative. All right, so today what I wanna talk about is the impact of depth psychology on the bottom line. I'm a big fan of Carl Jung. And um, I'm a consultant. I actually come out of project management, uh, oil refinery expansions, uh, robotics, construction, pharmaceuticals. I've worked on a lot of different projects, but I take a different approach. I tend to go for the human psyche first because, God, I've been doing this for about 40 years. And what I found was I, I've not run into technical inadequacy, but what I run into 100% of the time is politics. So uh -huh. the way I run my consulting practice is I look at the politics first, then I look at the balance sheet and the income statement, et cetera. And so what I want to talk about today is in the subtitle, how one's past stories influences business decisions. And I want to take you through an example of it. This is actually a live fire situation. It's a client I work with, but I want to show you the impact of where we are with our hearts really drives where we are with our heads. Our heart's the puppet master. It, it may seem invisible, but it really drives everything. So again, some of my personal history, um, oh, actually personal history, yeah, it can have a profound effect on decision-making, absolutely. And there's a myth in the United States, at least, that we leave our hearts at home on the mantle and then we go to work and then we're intellectual, you know, and we have Excel spreadsheets and, you know, we do statistics, et cetera. And that uh, emotions never play in the decision making. Well, in my experience, that's dead wrong. Uh, to buttress this, I had a, a therapist as a partner for four years and we did a lot of body language work. This is actually back in the 90s. We, we built a faux boardroom and we had the oval shaped table, but what was different was the center was missing. So it was like a torus. And what we would do is uh, we would watch their body language and um, we were in a separate room with cameras and we could turn the sound off. And if all we had to do was watch the body language and we knew what the outcome of the meeting was gonna be. And within three minutes of the meeting, we could predict the outcome of a three, a three or four hour meeting. And this just gets to emotions. 
people act out their emotions all the time through body language. So anyway, I continued and went deeper with this and got into personality assessments, which I use, I'm going to use a Jungian assessment, which I'll show you shortly to find out uh, where the, there's eight aspects of a person's personality, according to Jung. So I look to see where are they strong and where are they weak? And then how does that mix of strengths and weaknesses, how does that actually influence the person's vision and their thought process? Um, and so today, what I'm going to show you today, it's from a course I'm launching in about two months for uh, CEOs and owners, senior executives. And the title, tentative title is Wrestling with Chaos, A Business Owner's Guide to Simplicity. And what you're going to see here is an example of, of how I work. And then uh, anyway, uh, this is a piece of, the, of that. And specifically in this example, this is a family owned business and God, what a tar pit family owned businesses. And <laughs> talk about the, family owned businesses have a lot of needs and a lot of parallel needs, you know, cause there's at the dinner table at night, as well as out on the factory floor in the morning. And their needs include, they need wealth and estate management because there's always an eye on junior and sis, like, are they going to take over the company? Are we going to give them stock, et cetera? And by the way, one of the single biggest mistakes I see is giving children stock in the company at Christmas. Oh my God. This is like, <laughs> give them cash, but don't give them ownership in the company unless they're capable. Um, operations management, because again, personality, I love my daughter. So I'm going to give her an ops management job. Yeah, but she, she can't manage her way out of a paper bag. And then again, the succession planning, and this is where the knives can come out. It's very difficult. It, it can be very difficult uh, to do succession planning. The, one of the last clients I had, one of the sons had to get bought out because he was hyper competitive and he was getting in the way and he got so angry, he moved 300 miles away. And so mom, I think is still crying. But succession planning with family owned businesses, it, it, it's a huge problem. And naturally, there's a need for a board of directors. And this can help family owned businesses a lot because you know, they can bring honesty to the situation and, and get beyond that tar pit of, of relationships inside the business. So this makes consulting to family owned businesses difficult, especially when the business has hit a wall and it just can't grow anymore or profits are sh shrinking or market share is shrinking. And uh, they also may, because of the inherent biases that can occur, there may be certain types of problems they just can't solve because in their hiring practices, they've not hired across a range of capabilities. They've hired what they like and what fits with, with what they want to do. So again, what makes it tough? Well, yeah, we'll go a little deeper into that. So in frustration, what people will do in, in a reactive mode when these, when they're roiling from, from all these feelings and these reactive feelings inside themselves, uh, they'll say things to me like, well, we just need to do more of what's worked in the past. And I don't know why we hired you because look at our history. We've been, we've been good at this. And so it's like torpedoes be damn full speed ahead. And, and after all, it's worked for us or I've, I've even heard, well, my bank book's bigger than your bank book. So I must know better than you do, Gary. It's, it's, <laughs> there's kind of a love hate aspect of my relationships with my clients at times because they want the benefits of change, but they don't like doing the change. And so, so then what happens is they proceed to ap apply that definition of insanity very vigorously, you know, repeating what failed in the past and only doing it more so thinking this time we're going to have success. And what that usually results in is this. Uh, I, sometimes I feel like I work for WWE and uh, I, I'm, I'm just the referee inside the ring uh, pulling people apart. And obviously that, that just, that just doesn't work. So the question is, what do we do? 
Well, let's flip into chaos and complexity theory and borrow a few terms. Um, robust and resilient. These are two of my favorite terms as they're defined in complexity theory and as they're defined in resilience theory. So for robust, the thing to the, the way here's here's the best way to look at robust. I'm the biggest dog in the pack, so you got to do everything I tell you to do. And it worked this way in the past, so we're just going to double down and push even harder to make it work in the future. Now for resilient, a, a better picture is this. This is what resilient people do. They take advantage of their diversity. They understand the problem has multiple dimensions and they understand there's strange attractors all around them coming at them. Whitewater rafting actually is a very good metaphor for, for complexity and for chaos because you never know where the forces are going to come from. There's a need to react and do your individual responsibility, but also there's a coordination with the rest of the team so that you act as a unit. Okay, so let's get those out of there. So specifically with robust, what we tend to think is my way is sufficient. Let's just bend the environment and the people to my will and we'll get profits to start growing again. I just need to be more forceful, you know, doubling down. But now with resistance, to totally, totally different, resilience rather, totally different thinking. There's an admission that I'm missing something important. If, if sales have stalled or profits have stalled, what we need is diverse input and I think it's going to take a team. And there is a come to Jesus honesty about if we fail to get right with this problem, we're at risk for going out of business. We're at risk for losing everything. So said another way, when in a personal or a family or a business hell, the resilient person looks for a healthier path and they're because they're going to they want a path to get out of this hell and in contrast the robust person just goes out and buys fans they they're just not going to change their behaviors and consequently they stay stuck uh, and when i when i go to parties and people ask me you know what do i do i used to have this elevator pitch i even hired a coach you know i worked on it and you know golden pear-shaped tones and demosthenes would be jealous and you know what it, it you know what works better i just tell people i do adult daycare and immediately they start laughing and they start telling me about their boss or their coworker that's driving them nuts. And another thing I'll say is I just, I work with people that are stuck. And the thing is when we're stuck, well, it's back to, you know, Eva told you one of my favorite questions of clients is asking the question, who's the one person present at every problem you have. And boy, I've gotten some very angry responses. And I, and I appreciate that anger because now when the anger is out, that means the pretending is going away. And, and I'll tell the client, okay, we're ready to start working now. It's good that you're reacting to me. That means, that means we're engaging. So it's, it's, it's this thing about being stuck. Is it insane? Yes, it most definitely is insane. And the question is, can anything be done? Yeah, a lot can be done. Uh, I, I'm tempted. I've had this, some success with uh, some clients. I'll buy them a copy of Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. It's one of my favorite books. Now, now I personally, I practice secular Buddhism. I, I'm not interested in religion. And if you are, that's fine. I just am trying to find my ass with both hands and... Uh, have my butt and my brain connected in the same time zone. So uh, I practice secular Buddhism. And actually that's what underpins 
a lot of what you're seeing here is bringing those principles that what the Stoics talk, talk about, et cetera, is actually bringing them into business. And they work. They work extremely well, but it, they read easy. They do hard. It's a real challenge. So, yes, we can do something. So the question is, what exactly can we do? <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a frog in my throat. Well, that depends. Depends on how much a person is willing to change. And specifically, work on their weak areas. <clears throat> when, when I work with clients, I introduce them to essentially three types of change the and it all gets to the rules in the first type of change the rules there is no change in the rules we just amplify what we're doing you know we we just expand the factory we hire more people etc and most people can do that because they just stay with their strengths and they do more of what they're good at then the next type of change is <clears throat> excuse me the rules don't change but we rearrange the furniture because we're going to add a location etc and they can get their growth but it's the third type of change that's that's where i work and that's in the weak areas and what typifies the weak areas is the rules have fallen apart and that's that's where i come into play and the company's going into a free fall and they're not sure what to do Uh, let's talk about that from a slightly different angle. So the question is, how do you accrue success? And that may seem like an odd statement, accruing success, but let's, I think it'll make sense if we look a little deeper. And if it doesn't, send me a note in chat and, <laughs> or connect with me on LinkedIn and we can argue. Um, if, if we're going to have those first two types of changes that I talked about where the rules don't change. Well, then we do robust behavior. We, we just basically do more of what we did. We may have some veneer changes, but we, we do what's called robust behavior. And robust behavior, success is characterized by being a mix of skills. And now here's what's critical. A mix of skills plus coping mechanisms. And that's the Achilles heel. What am I talking about? Well, the skill set will come from building the business around one's personality strengths. And, and this is what a lot of people do when they go into business. Mom and dad and the teachers pat them on the back, or they, they have an innate enthusiasm to do something. And what happens is of those eight components that Jung talks about that makes up our psyche, they take the two big dogs, the really strong ones, and they build a business around their strengths. Now, the problem is with the weaker components, they develop coping mechanisms. And coping mechanisms are destructive because if I choose to engage in a coping mechanism, what I'm trying to do is scapegoat you to take on my responsibilities. So, for example, let me stay with myself. I'm INTJ. You know, I see dead people. I, I recognize patterns quickly, and uh, and I love, uh, uh, even I've talked about this a lot, I love cognitive dissonance. I can hold different frames of mind simultaneously and see what that evolves to to get a customer solution. Where I'm not good is with details. Uh, the, the first year I went into business, I literally walked into my accountant's office with a glad bag full of receipts thinking, okay, we're going to do my taxes. Uh, this, this was decades ago, but I wasn't good with details. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so what happened is I, I paid, I had to pay the price. Uh, I ended up underpaying my taxes. And so I had to get a loan. I had to set up a payment plan with the IRS. So I built my business around my strengths, which is my insightfulness and my ability to verbalize, but I let go of some of the details. Okay, this is what happens with all of us. I mean, this is garden variety screwing up. We lead with our strengths, and what we do is we tend to push off 
or ignore the areas about which we're not that really interested. That means we're going to hurt somebody. We're either going to hurt ourselves or we're going to hurt the people around us. Coping mechanisms are destructive, period. There's no such thing as a good coping mechanism. When I see this in writing sometimes, it's like my hair goes on fire right away. There's no such thing as a good coping mechanism because it means the person's not looking honestly at the situation. So in order to, to get beyond the robust aspect, change is needed. And this means movement. And the specific movement is we have to move from being robust to being resilient. Just keep those two pictures in mind. It's probably the best representations I've ever come up with for, you know, three books. I kind of like these two pictures better. <laughs> so with resilient change, rather than overdeveloping our strengths and shed trying to scapegoat someone else to take care of our weaknesses we actually walk into our weaknesses and we work to develop them now we may never be as good as someone who was born with more strength in our weaker areas but we can at least learn how to talk to that person who's strong where we're not and develop a respectful peer relationship with them and move into into this resilience where we just work as a team and we morph around around the problems. I find this very exciting. This is where I want to live my life. I like people and I like solving problems and that's that's all I really care to do. <laughs> so with resilient change, there are no coping mechanisms. Now, this is an ideal to be achieved because uh, unless you're God, you're going to have some coping mechanisms. But the focus, we don't do quick fixes. We fix and then we move on. So that if, if we do have to compromise and resilient change, we note that we're compromising and we keep track of the compromises because we're taking on the risk management responsibility to come back and address those compromises and the impact of those compromises. I'm huge on risk management. It's one of the first things I teach my clients is, is risk management because we're human beings and nobody makes a perfect decision and, and you know, who knows what's going to happen down the road with our business. So there, there are tools for measuring our relative strengths and weaknesses in these eight areas. And, and I actually use the best one on the market. Uh, statistically, it's the best one. It's the majors PT elements. And I'm actually gonna use this to show you some results where one of the owners of the company thought he was making a really good business decision. But when you see how he profiles, you'll see that what he was doing was he was running away from his weaknesses and he wanted to call that a good business decision. <laughs> and I wouldn't, and he and I would go back and we ended up okay, but, but he would get mad at me and I'd say, Oh no, you're just ducking, but it's your company. And if you want to go in another direction, my responsibility is to help you go in another direction. And he did. So when we try to change, this is usually what we run into. <laughs> We will get anxiety, we get tear, well, actually that's not really the best picture. The appropriate picture is, um, oh no, look at what you're doing to me. You're hurting my position. I had it so good here and now you're making those changes and I'm upset. So it's very important to work with people because th this is the reality of situations. When, whenever a company makes a change, the first thing people think of is themselves. Change is threatening. It, it can be anxiety, it can be anxiety provoking, even positive change. Think about the trepidation a bride or a groom can have when they're getting married, because it's like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I'm locking up with this person legally. And they want to go through with the wedding, but they're nervous at the same time. So actually positive change can be just as threatening as negative change at times. <clears throat> Sorry for this frog in my throat. I don't know where it came from. Another reaction we can get is Superman or Superwoman, where 
I'm going to come in and single-handedly, I'm going to turn things around and I'm going to save the company. Yeah, <laughs> good luck with that. I tried, I tried that once. I actually put myself in the hospital with exhaustion uh, because I thought, by God, I can, because I could see all the problems, I could fix them all. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't work. Or I can protect myself by being the constant critic that's always looking over the top of my glasses at, at everyone and criticizing everything. So it makes it look like I'm in the know and I really know what we should be doing. But ask actually if I engage in that behavior, I'm just masking fear. Now, if you're lucky, you'll actually get cooperation. But I, I think I've had that in 40 years, I've had that one time where everybody admitted they were scared to death <clears throat> and they committed to being proactive. It was great. It was one of the best assignments I ever had. So it can, the way I like to explain it is you can feel like, you're in, if, if any of you are Monty Python fans, it can feel like you're in that one episode, the 100 meter dash for the spatially disoriented. So when the gun goes off, Everybody runs in a different direction based on their coping mechanisms. So what can you do? Well, I'm a big believer in principles. The simplest way to do things is to work with cohesive principles. It, it just, because principles reflect balance of the reality that's present. And that's, and f for myself, what that's boiled down to is, oops, what's going on here? Looking at three key areas of change. We have the business strategy, the business plan, the business case. And in this situation, with this company, we were looking at growth, stagnation, merger, or selling. Those were the three, the four options that were available. Then we can look at the project management and change management involved. And by the way, if any of you are agile fanatics, please do not pass out seeing the phrase project management. You can do agility, you can do traditional precedence diagramming, I don't really care. Just you know, do what works. And then the third one, which is actually the first one, we address the people in politics. And to affect change in complex situations, you have to do all three simultaneously. And that's where who you are as a person is called out. Uh, I, I've had, I've given a lot of talks and I've had people come up to me afterwards saying, I like to, I want to do what you're doing. This sounds really interesting. And, and I, I've gotten, there's two questions. One is, what, what's your biggest problem? And I always tell them me, because my job is to be principle-based. And if, if I walk into a client's office and I'm not principle-based, well, I'm cheating the client. I'm taking their money. I'm not providing service. And it's hard to do, well, back to meditations, back to the Stoics. It, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Um, and the other thing, and I just went blank on what the other thing was. Well, I'll come back to it. <laughs> I'll tell you when I remember. Um, so what we're going to focus on here for the rest of my presentation is people in politics. Okay, now let's go through this chart. There's, there's a lot here. Okay, first off, this is this is a young this is a Jungian chart and it's based on this assessment the majors PT elements and those eight areas that Jung believed reflects our psyches and those eight areas are the ability to handle details the ability to think of options and possibilities a focus on tradition and history and how things meld with the past insightfulness. When you come into a situation, can you see what's going on? 
do you have the ability to be commanding even in difficult situations? Will you take charge? What about relationships? Do you focus on your team? Do you support your team? Do you know who's going to have a baby, who might get divorced, et cetera? You know, this whole thing of relationships, this is really important. Then there's what I call the Einstein factor, mental models, building models of situations that in the abstract reflect the reality that's going on. And then importantly, values. What values do you have? And uh, do they promote a community or do they promote me first? So, oh, then the, the, uh, the Y axis is a score from zero to a hundred where the median, and this, this assessment's given, been given to about 50,000 people. So it's, statistically, it's, it's very good. The median is 50. If you had 50s all the way across here, okay, you're probably in a Zen-like state and good for you. Um, but what you see here is we, we over here on the right, there's seven relatives that I include in this example. I actually assess the entire company, um, most of the company, over 100 people. But I want to go with the seven people at the top. And specifically, we're going to see the chart. We're going to break out this one guy. We're going to do that later. Let's, let's look at the group first. Now, remember, we're looking at options and possibilities and how are we going to go forward into the future? Okay, to do that, there are three traits people need to have in order to do that. Options and possibilities. They need to be insightful and they need to be grounded in solid values that are appropriate for the circumstances and appropriate for the people with whom they're working. Look at the scores of this company. These are seven senior managers and they crapped out. It was a nightmare working with them. In fact, where they scored high was on details. So I would try to ask a strategic question and they would start bombarding me with spreadsheets and all these details because they could do details. You know, but wait, there's more. <laughs> Where did they score high? They scored high with the past tradition and they scored high on command. Okay, this is a formula for a master sergeant or a master chief. And so what would happen is when we met, because they couldn't think of options, they lacked insight, and they, other than where their bank books were, they actually didn't have a lot of value. Since they couldn't address these three functions, they went back to the familiar and they started fighting with each other. Now they would tell me in the meeting, well, we're being good business people. And I actually, I got to the point, I took this chart and I just projected it up on the wall when we'd have another meeting and they were gonna start fighting. And I said, look, don't go telling me you're good business people, good business people, you know what you're talking about. You're stuck. You don't want to look at your weaker areas. So what do you do? You go back to your strengths. You've all been good at being bossy. And guess what? Bossy is not going to get you out of this situation. And the one gentleman I want to look at who was the chief operating officer, he scored the highest on bossiness. And he was very proud of himself. Now he, I'll get, I'll get into his upbringing when I get to the to the next slide. So what occurred with this chief operating officer is, I brought a therapist on board. By the way, I would say with the senior executives I work with, a good sixty percent, I end up moving into therapy. And then the therapist and I will work with the person and then we'll triangulate what behavior did they do in business and how's that affecting their psyche. Very powerful method. It works, it works really well. So the attorney was brought in a CM is me. That's CM stands for change manager. So there was a therapist, a change manager and the family attorney. And she was really good. She, the therapist and I bonded as a very compassionate team 
but it was principle based and we challenged. And so what occurred is in working with the chief operating officer, his inability to see options, we actually got him to think more in terms of options and possibilities. So he moved up a, a one and a half standard deviations, which that's that's quite a bit of movement. This guy was like doggedly determined person. He he really would push hard when he decided on doing something. Then the the issue of the traditions, we got him to back off and think more about options because he was the one. Oh, this is how I've always done it. You know, when I, I found that I I was sweeping the floors. Uh, in this company, and I went all the way up to being president and I, or CEO, COO, and I bought it out with with my family. So he was very proud of his traditions, but we got him to dial it down a bit, and we got him to turn the volume down. He he was just everyone was hiding because as their fear their fear was getting consumed by a national competitor that was in construction that was going to move into their territory. And they didn't know what to do. And so what this chief operating officer would do is he, the more afraid he became, the bossier he got. So we got him to dial that down. And then we also got him to think about his people and his values. And there was progress made. <laughs> there was a lot of professionals involved. This was like a th this is a three ring circus, and that's me, the change manager, and I was like I was orchestrating all of this, working with we, we got a board of directors established. We worked more on a succession planning, wealth planning, etc., and then like I had mentioned, the therapist and the attorney, and I had to bring in some other outside people to critique the way they were running their business, and all of this was done based on psychological type those eight processes that I was telling you about. So it's monitoring all three aspects, the people in politics, the change management and project management and the business case and whether or not we're moving forward. That's my job is to watch that balance. And then as a change manager, uh, manage the boundaries between all these people and bring them together to talk, okay, how are we gonna move this organism to get to success? The final decision when we did all this, he couldn't, the COO couldn't do it. And if he couldn't do it, the other six people were going to go along because while he wasn't the, the president, he was the chief operating officer and everything ran on his back, so to speak. He couldn't do it. So they sold the company. Family owned business, over 300 employees, did about $40 million a year, and they sold it. And I stayed in touch with employees afterwards. Not a pleasant scene. And this is what happens when people insist on being robust and thinking that's enough, when they lack the courage to be resilient and to walk into those, uh, I always say it's like all those noises up in the attic that have been there your entire life. Okay, it's time to open the door and go up and see what those noises are about. You have, if you really want to succeed, you got to go into your shadow and you have to drag all these things that have been put off, things that have been compromised. They have to be brought out to the light of day. And if not, you do things like this and sell the company. And he had this spiel about how it was a great business decision, et cetera. But eventually we got to the point where he admitted, I'm tired. And I don't, he said, he said, I don't want to change. I finally, I got him to admit to that. I thought, okay, at least you're being honest. So if you're in, in working in this kind of environment where you bring chaos and complexity theory and resilience engineering and uh, Carl Jung, et cetera, when you bring them together, I had mentioned stoicism and secular Buddhism you have to have one foot in the business and you have to have the other foot in the brain. And you've got to work them both simultaneously because you've got to translate back and forth if you're going to come up with a realistic plan for the client. So the key is empathy, 
compassion, discipline, and humility. Oh, that was the other thing I wanted to say earlier. I'll, I'll get asked, so if you want to be a change manager, what's the number one characteristic you should have? And no one's ever prepared for my answer. It's humility. Because humility is where I know, I know the boundary is to where I end and you begin, where my strengths drop off and your strengths pick up. That's the key to success to do this. It's humility. It's not being Schwarzeneggerian and seeing, you know, can I be the big dog? <laughs> nah. I, there was a time I wanted to be the big dog, but actually I have more fun working with people. Uh, I cook a lot. In fact, when, when if it's an in-town uh, uh, client, although I, I, I work all over the world and I, don't, I haven't had an in-town in client in a long time, I'd have them over for dinner. I cook pasta from scratch. So I was, I buy semolina flour in 50 pound bags. I, there's this thing about community. That's where business success is. It's in community. And so that's where empathy, compassion, discipline, and humility, this is, this is the key. And don't get me wrong. All of the, the technical textbooks that are written on change, et cetera, they are important but they need to be grounded in these four elements. And, and if they're not, you know, devil get thee behind me. I'm, I'm not interested in working with you because what will happen is when these are lacking, people become transactional. And when people become transactional, somebody's going to get hurt. It, it's pretty much that simple. So that's about it. If you're interested in this major's PT elements, uh, you can go, I have two websites. The one is AureliusPress.com. That's if you want to purchase it. If you're interested in the assessment, let me know. I actually have a podcast called Wrestling with Chaos. And that's where I picked the title up for the course I'm going to do, Wrestling with Chaos. Uh, and let's see, I think I have all my connecting information here. Um, so I guess we're at, uh, Q&A. I hope this has been beneficial. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gary. I, for me, it was very insightful. We had, during your presentation, there was quite a good uh, talk going on in the chat as well. So everybody loved to share his personality type and <laughs> things. I will not repeat all of that. Um, there was uh, one comment from Jake Hoban. Maybe you want to react to that. I just will read it out. Yeah. My belief in the usefulness of MBDI has waned. There are other tools that seem to predict behavior better, but ultimately there's no substitute for getting to know each other as people by showing up honestly. Well, your last statement is everything, showing up honestly. MBTI. I used to use MBTI. I don't. MBTI has statistical problems. The, the creator of the assessment I use used to be the lead statistician for MBTI. And, and the problem, well, I'll tell you the truth, MBTI is a family owned business. And what they've gone towards is how many of these suckers can we sell? And they've been pretty resistant on updating their statistical models. At least that's what I've been told. And if I'm mistaken, you got people have my LinkedIn <laughs> and you can tell me how they've improved. The model I use was more grounded. Uh, it's about 93 to 95% accurate. Myers-Briggs is about 73 to 75% accurate. And also the assessment I use is the only one in the world that measures those eight functions I was telling you. It measures them directly. Others imply them, but this one actually has been statistically validated for uh, measuring those eight functions. And that, that's really, and that's one of the anchors in my business. And uh, the other thing is, I want to take my shot at the five-factor model. <laughs> I have problems with the five-factor model because it's promoted a lot in business. And one of the things businesses want to do is they want to slot people as fast as they can. And one of the abuses of psychological assessments is using it to slot people. You're not supposed to do that. It's supposed to give the person the opportunity to discover who they are and see what they want to do in life. It's not meant to be used to slot people. In other words, I could, I could be a very strong feeling, a strong feel that kindergarten teacher, you know, that was 
strong in the feelings. You know, that person can become an accountant. They don't have to be ISTJ or ESTJ, which most accountants are. No, they can be an ENFP. And the five-factor model's like, no, 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 slot people, slot people, slot people. And also it emphasizes extroversion, and I'm a very strong introvert. So personally, <laughs> I'm insulted. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it sounds actually when you when you say that strict that it it uh, like gives you your faith. It reminds me of the officially non-existent caste system in India, <laughs> so where like your caste is telling you what you are, which role you're able to play in life, and which role you don't. Uh, but okay, uh, we had another comment from Bezir. Hi, Gary. I think the crying baby image is an accurate gauge. One of the thing with cry bullies and temper tantrums, there is always a link to childhood. So is it more temper tantrums when people face change? Yes. Uh, th thank you for that question, because I left a chunk of my presentation out. Uh, the, Bezir is here now. He can talk to you. Okay. The, the, <laughs> uh, the, thank you, everyone. Uh, I heard you, and you're spot on, because the COO, when you looked at his childhood, he never knew who his father was, and I think his mother was a prostitute. I mean, they were they lived hand to mouth. They moved three times in one month at one time. I mean, just, but this guy, man, he was determined. Well, he became COO of a $40 million company and, and was a major shareholder in it, but but what you had said is correct. You know, the, the bullies, and he went to bullying, he could not address his childhood. And the therapist and I tried to work with him to be more honest about where he came from and what was done to him. But he couldn't do it. So he, he flipped into being a bully. And, and the other piece I want to add to that, what I've learned, and this is true for me, and it's true for everybody, we all get hit with the unfairness of life. And when we can't embrace the unfairness of life, we turn into monsters. So I really appreciate your, your observation. I, I think it's spot on. Uh, Gary, let me share as to how I came across it because I had a lot of my friends and uh, when they persist and insist on certain things, there's almost like a childhood element that you know all of a sudden the person that you know is a 35 year old, 40 year old is changing and I have, uh, security background behavioral analysis oh so, what i mean i'm not a psychologist but i practically asked several of my buddies whether they were cry bully or not and the moment they hear that they just get shocked like for like five to ten seconds until they process that create a defense i think you should definitely come to turkey because there are a lot of uh, family-owned businesses that are trying to become more corporate more professional oh my god family a gold family mine. I'm coming. <laughs> family constitution and the poor corporate governance folks. You know, they go to all of these corporate governance trainings, family constitution, and this. Wow, they need you more than the, the corporate gov both the corporate governance and the family businesses. So it was very insightful. Thank you. Thank sir. you. And I'd be glad to go. I like to travel. Uh, I will introduce you, sir. Thank you. Okay, Th that that sounds good. Um, Oh, crap. There was something else. My sometime. I'm too old. I keep on forgetting stuff. I'll remember what I was going to see. You triggered a thought for me, but the thought decided to take a vacation. Um, anything else? Um, yeah, there was now a, from Jake again. There were two comments, actually, which I've always wanted to, to put into this room. The first one was that his comment is tradition is a two sided thing, it can be a source for wisdom, but it can also be a hindering factor in change. And the second sentence which I love he just put there is hurt people hurt people. And I think this is very accurate to to what you just explained, don't you? <clears throat> yeah, if if we had time, we could go into the psychology of shame and how hurt people hurt people, because the whole idea. Uh, ten is, minutes. Can you do that in ten minutes? I, can do I maybe want to less. know more. Okay. I want to know more. Okay. Join well, our, okay, join our Eva, 11 p.m. session on fear, we're, Rob. Yeah, we're going to talk about fear. Actually, if you come to the 11 p.m. session, we can talk about it more. <laughs> Because yes. what what happens is, why well, I always go back to George Carlin is one of my favorite stories. I think the last time he came out of rehab, a reporter asked him, "How old are you?" 
And he said, I'm one, I'm two, I'm three, I'm four, I'm five. And he counted all the way up to like 50 or whatever age he was at. And the reporter like did a Scooby-Doo like, what? And he said, well, what I learned in rehab is if you look at the neuropsychological development of people, the, the brain comes along at a certain rate and it doesn't finish till what, it's 27. And what happens is windows open up along the way. And those are opportunities for healthy parents to teach children how to embrace themselves and how to relate to the rest of the world in a loving way. The problem is if our parents in their own lives had problems at that age, say three years old, then what they do is they inflict on us what was inflicted on them when they were three. So Basir, getting back to your point, so what Carlin realized is he had this whole cacophony in his head of I'm one, I'm two, I'm three. And, and oh, I got to be careful. I could talk about this for like three or four hours. It, so what happens is that reactivity, those reactive elements across the ages within us, they find each other and they're mutually reinforcing. And the problem is they're housed in the limbic system, which is the fastest part of the brain. You know, amygdala, amygdala is real big now in popular sight. So the problem is the part of us that wants to be a jerk moves faster than any other part of us. And, and that's why, I mean, that's what brought me to Buddhism. I just wanted to stop. Honest to God, I didn't have any high minded whatever. And that's where we need to slow down to get in touch with those hurts to decide to do something different. And but, but one last thing behind every hurt, behind every bullying urge, is a part of ourselves we've pushed into the darkness to protect ourselves from the transgression we were experiencing when we were younger. So the things you don't like about yourself are doorways. Don't get mad at yourself. That's just the messenger. It's not a comfortable messenger. And just explore to see what's on the other side. And that's why I'll work with the therapist and work with the business simultaneously, because when owners and managers start doing this, they start relaxing and and they start getting simpler uh the problem is their ego can get in the way but anyway come to our fear talk that even yes. i are going to have <laughs> uh, there is a... one more question which i really want to to bring to you because uh, i find it very interesting please comment on the importance of the neurotic component of the big five in how people behave in business and i find this is a very interesting aspect uh, baloney is the word that comes to mind for me. Oh, <laughs> why is it baloney? Why? Well, I, I go back to who uses these assessments the most. It's business. Hmm. There, there, there's gentler ways to frame these elements might be another way to put it. And so all the money behind the five factor comes from big business. Well, big business wants what it wants when it wants it. And maybe I'm being a bit harsh. And if there's any five factor people here, connect with me and we can lash each other. You know, you know, I'll come at you with my Jesuit logic and you can come back at me with whatever. I'm, a, I'm about empathy and framing, framing things from an empathetic perspective. Not, let's take, okay, let's go back to introversion. The, <laughs> Um, it's defined in the five factor is less than extroversion. Introversion comes across more as, and so what's that lead to? A lot of companies think, oh, all your leaders should be extroverts. And guess what happens to that company? When a problem comes along that requires introversion, they can't see it because they've only promoted extroverted people. It, it, anyway, that's... That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> but I'll be glad to argue with anybody about it. Uh, Gary, um, I'm also a quote unquote uh, hard INTJ. Um, so I'm curious um, if you think to a large degree or a substantial degree <laughs> that your choice of career um, has been about making sense of what to quote unquote our type seems to be the general irrationality of humankind and making oh, sense oh. of that to later discover that it all makes sense once you figure out the drivers and the motivations oh, uh, yeah 100 percent. 
Uh, Jung's advice was you should only enter a career that allows you to explore and discover yourself. <clears throat> I, I grew up in a household of S's and I'm an intuitive and I was odd man out. My parents could never understand me because I would see patterns. I would see things. They had no idea what I was talking about. Now, if I switched to Lego type conversations, like my dad's hobby was photography, what should the focal length be? What should this, you know, shutter speed be? Oh, we could have a great conversation. But if I said, do you see that trend over there, dad, that's going to no registration. So yeah, I've spent my life just being INTJ and trying to bring it to the world. That was my big conversion was when I decided to just be myself and then connect. And then now diversity comes into play because it, when, when you have a team, you need different frames of mind. So I had to learn to work with extroverts and I was like, God, it was awful. No, I'm just, I'm just joking. <laughs> Yeah, no, thanks. I, I, I had a sneaking suspicion that that was the case, but. Um, oh, good. My, 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 my personal experience has been particularly in corporate settings. If something really doesn't make sense in the true sense of the word, it makes perfect sense if you see beyond, you know, into the shadow. Bingo. And figure out who the person was. Bingo. You know, why is my boss such a pushover? He was a fat kid who got bullied and was a loser and now he's in a position of authority but he's inherently deferential and that's his bridge yes. he cannot right. cross um so i empathize and i try to you know pump his tires to represent my interest uh up the chain uh yeah. and in in such scenarios in in corporate life right it can be challenging i think uh, and yeah and i want to encourage you to keep on doing what you're doing because if you look at books on becoming a consultant etc most of them are extrovertish. They're not introverted. And the thing is, I have a consulting practice and I do pretty good and I'm an introvert. Uh, and it, it's important just to be who we are and then bring that to other people and see if they'll risk being who they are. And then we see what we can build together. And oh my God, that's when abundance sets in. But, but this thing about being the big dog, you know, what you were talking about and it was mentioned earlier, a lot of business decisions are just in reaction to child unresolved childhood issues or early adult issues. And like, I'm in control now or, and I'm going to do it. And then the other thing that I've noticed is uh, Plato would refer to it as being asleep. If a person is unexamined in their life, they'll just do what their parents did. And that's why you get so many bad managers. You know, there's, there's an old project management joke. Um, what do you get when you promote your best engineer to the manager of the department? Uh, you lose your best engineer and you get the worst manager you ever had. Yeah, uh, I spent six years at 3M company, so affirmative. <laughs> <laughs> Two I and TJ, we found each other. Oh, by the way, uh, I refer to myself as winter boots. Uh, and the reason is when people are yumpty dumping along, and they're kind of asleep and they're getting what they want, you know, watching Seinfeld reruns and stuff like that. They just don't want to be bothered. Well, then they leave me in the closet. But when that corporate blizzard hits, that's two feet of snow. Oh, where's Gary? Cause he's good at figuring out these kind of problems. And then they keep me around till the snow plow comes and then they put me back in the closet till the next blizzard. So I just refer to myself as winter boots. Uh, I don't get invited to many parties, I guess. So I'm very sorry that I have to cut this awesome communication here now, because it seems it's a topic which is really touching a lot of people. So I really invite everyone to join us at the 11 p.m. session, Who I, What Are You Afraid Of? with Gary and myself. It will be an open com conversation, so everybody is uh, free to join us. Uh, and now I hand it over to you, Rob, and Thomas, I believe.